Do you know what the hardest part of this episode has been? <laughs> the hardest part of this episode has been this right now, this introduction that I'm doing right now. And it's a problem sometimes when you get into a guest like this week's guest, Emily Dolan Davies, who has just simply accomplished and is doing so much. It's like, where do you draw the line? on listing this person's freaking credits, okay? She is the touring drummer for Kim Wilde, among many others. She is the house drummer for The Voice Kids UK. She is the host of the A Drummer's Guide to podcast. She was featured in the really terrific Netflix documentary, Count Me In. She is a former member of the darkness. She is becoming a coach and a mentor to creatives all over the world. Emily Dolan Davies is just a dang impressive human being with just such a growing list of credits and accomplishments. And how do you encapsulate all of that in an introduction that does not go on too freaking long? This is the problem. The last time Emily was on our show, 2019, I did a horrendous, long, boring introduction. And I, I have come a long way since then. I'm getting more hip to it, but you still have to deliver something as a preamble, right? And so what I'm going to say is that this is a very long episode. I considered breaking it into two. I'm not going to do that because I do not want to interrupt the flow. And it is worth utterly whatever time investment it will require to listen, okay? We have a ton of insight and a ton of perspective from Emily who is a person who's just really impressive, all right? She has such a wonderful attitude. She has such a wonderful energy. And if you want more than this, if you want more than this episode, please go to emilydrums.com, follow her on all the socials, pick up just the really terrific content that Emily is producing day in and day out. You know, you need your inspirations, kids, especially these days post-pandemic. You really need to be following people who can inspire and educate and take you to another level, not just creatively, but as a human being. Emily Dolan Davies is one of those people. I am beyond delighted to welcome her back to this program and we'll get to it on the other side. Listening to the John Huff Podcast. Oh, yeah. Oh, no. It's been four years. I mean, where is the time gone? I mean, a lot has happened in the world since we last spoke. Yeah. I mean, it's a. I don't even know what to say, but like. The, I know. It's, <laughs> it's it about, start? about two of those years uh, are just a complete blank right like it's don't count yeah in a weird way it's as though there was just a gap in our history and yeah it's like the whole world just went on pause it did what did you do at that time well <laughs> so you know how like i feel like you kind of have an understanding how my brain works and i'm starting to realize it's not like most people's brains <laughs> but so when it all kicked off I had a bunch of touring booked in uh, with Kim Wilde and all of that. And obviously that all got canned straight away. And when it was all kicking off, I was at the end of the filming for The Voice Kids. So I would started The Voice Kids just after we spoke last. Um, and that was kind of like everyone was a bit unsure. Anyway, we managed to finish this series. So basically my whole year of touring got cancelled. And I was like, I mean, I'm lucky. You know, I had the studio. Obviously, I still have the studio. This is a different one now. So I was like, okay. I have the ability to pivot and I just thought logically like, all right, there's going to be a lot of musicians that have a lot of time on their hands, probably to finish their passion projects. We sure. don't know how long this is going to carry on for. So let me put all my sort of concentration into that. And then as I started thinking about that, I started feeling guilty <laughs> because it's me. And I was feeling guilty that, you know, I'm in this incredible situation where I can carry on working. And then I was like, 
I need to teach other people how to do this so that they can do it too. So then I sort of pivoted again and um, just created this course to help people with the business side of running a remote, remote recording business and being a remote session musician. Um, so I sort of, I, I literally buried myself away for about a month just recording this course and getting the materials together just so that I could sort of put it out there in the world to hopefully help some people along the way. Um, yeah, and then I guess that was the next sort of year and a half for me. It was like all recording and then helping other people to kind of move into that space as well. Um, and it, it, it kept me very busy. It kept me very sane because, as you know, I'm not good if I'm not busy. <laughs> I, I turn into an, oh, I just, I go a bit mad. So, yeah. What about you? What were you doing in the time? Oh, I. it's funny because I, I listened – in the past week to our previous episode. I just want to remember what we had gone over and what we said. And I distinctly noted that I had asked you what's coming up for you. This is 2019. And you said a bunch of touring with Kim Wilde coming. And, and then, yeah, that kind of struck me when I heard it the second time around. And I had tours booked for 2020 as well. I had, um, there, was, there were two Europe tours that were booked for that year. And obviously those were canceled. And I mean, it was for me such an intense experience. I mean, COVID came into our consciousness. I was on the road in Texas and we had just begun to hear rumors. <laughs> just this, yeah. this buzz was coming into the air about this thing, this pandemic, which was treated very much like a joke, really, initially, yeah. right? Yeah. Because we've heard of this sort of thing before, and it never amounted to much. So people were like, oh, okay, here we go again. But it's, the noise started getting louder and louder and louder. And then we basically just beat the virus back across the border. Like things shut down very soon after we got back from the States. And then it got real. And so whatever my plans were, were utterly gone. Mm. and then my mental state kind of went with it at a certain point. Right. I mean, so, yeah, I think that was a lot of us. Yeah, it was tough. Like it, it, was, it was very intense. And so I spent a lot of 2020 having kind of a meltdown. Oh, really? <laughs> Honestly, oh, yeah. i sorry to hear that. Yeah. 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 And, and uh, I'm sure I'm not the only one. And so I, I don't even remember a lot of that. It was just mm. basic survival mode, and then. But you're out the other side, which is the main thing, and we're all mostly. out the other side. So you know, mostly, yeah. yeah. Like I say, I I I know myself, and I know had I not of just created work for myself, essentially, I would have been in exactly the same position because I think it got so easy to get wrapped up in everything that was going on worldwide, and it just felt so intense and hopeless and just endless that I had to find something in my own little world that I could control a little bit so that I didn't feel so helpless you know so that's kind of how I dealt with it but it's oh it was a rough time it was a rough time for everyone and seeing everyone go through it and even talking about it and hearing about your experience retrospect retrospectively is still just terrible like really really bad it is, but I, I, it's so you the way that you dealt with that. I mean, it, no, I mean, and I, and that's a, a huge compliment because what I notice, especially interestingly, in the last year or so, on your social media, on your public presence, there is so much coming from you that is about helping people and serving people, and so it's in no way a surprise to me that you took that time and dedicated yourself to creating something for other people. I mean, this is, this is you now you're becoming a coach. Like literally <laughs> you are, I mean, you're offering coaching now. It's like, where does this come from, Emily? This is Emily, everybody, by the way. I, this is not how. <laughs> yeah. Hi, by the way. <laughs> I did not intend to start this conversation this way, but Oh, let's I love just, it. Let's just go. Let's just start we're just it. we're just catching up. I mean, this is great. Anyone that's interested in just being a fly on the wall. But um <laughs> yeah, I mean, in all honesty, this whole coaching thing and going down that route and helping people, it's it's kind of just developed and and uh, evolved in such a way that 
I kind of find myself here and I'm like, I love this. Like this is, I, I love helping people. I've always been like that since I was a kid. Um, but often I'd be in a position where I was so busy trying to help myself that I didn't feel that I had anything to give to help other people, if that makes sense. Because I didn't, I felt, I suppose I felt quite broken for a long time. Um, and it was only in, it was in 2018 that I, <laughs> it's going to sound really morbid and I don't know where this train of thought came from. I assume I read a book because that usually is what happens with me. I'll listen or re listen to or read a book and an idea will just spark something. And I think it was this idea of um, writing your eulogy for when you die. And what do you want to be remembered for? And the only things that I could think of were I would like to be known as being kind and helping other people basically and um I just thought you know how how can I do that kind of thing and then I just thought about how can I reach a lot of people and what can I help them with okay well I could share my experience the other thing is I have a really bad memory like the worst memory and by the way I apologize in advance if I start saying things on this episode that I've already said on the last episode because my my memory is so bad but I did think the other thing is I'd, I'd like to uh, almost document what like stories of tours I've been on or experiences that I've had, because at some point I will be dead. This is so morbid. At some point I will be dead. And so at least people can look back and still be able to get something from my experience, hopefully. And I'll still be able to help people even when I'm not here. I don't know if that sounds really weird and morbid and horrible, but that's kind of where the seeds spawned from. And it's, kind of just like I say evolved into this thing where for some reason a lot of the stuff that I put out there kind of resonates with people and it makes people feel more connected it makes people feel less alone which was always a massive thing when I was growing up learning to play drums and trying to get into the industry I felt very alone and it's one of the worst things when you're struggling if you feel isolated as well and like no one can understand you no one's been through this like I have all those things that's such a bad place to be in. And, and I, I don't believe anything good can really come from that mindset. So just to be able to be the person going, hello, I went through that and it sucks, but you're not alone. It's, it's going to be okay. Just keep pushing, keep pushing. It's going to be all right sort of thing. So I guess in a way I was trying to create something that was what I needed when I was going through all that sort of stuff. And as I say, it's kind of evolved into now doing like, uh, like you say, social media stuff, which I've been doing for ages anyway. Um, the podcast is coming back as would, of the yeah. 1st of July. I was going to ask I, you, we'll get to that, sure. I'm so excited. Um, and then, uh, yeah, and then doing this one-on-one -on -one coaching with people because one of my favorite things is kind of really connecting with someone one-on-one -on -one and finding out about them, what makes them tick, and then hopefully helping them to move forward in whatever direction they want to go in. Like that is so fulfilling to me. So um, yeah, like I said, I find myself in this position and I'm I'm enjoying it a lot, which is uh, really nice. I'm very lucky, very, very lucky. No, but you've, the thing is, maybe you're lucky, but you've also made this. Like the reason that you could do a course about home recording is because you're actually doing the home recording. I mean, there's a, whether you intend it or not, there's an entrepreneurial angle to so much of what you're doing, like what you're doing, you're able to make a business from the coaching thing though. That's compelling. Did you have a feeling of self doubt or imposter syndrome going into that? Was it difficult to put yourself out there in that way? Oh, Absolutely. I mean, I think I thrive on imposter syndrome because it makes me always uh, want to strive to be better, but I certainly felt a lot of responsibility. So I'd been wanting to do the coaching thing, like the one-on-one -on -one thing for a couple of years, but I, I didn't feel, like I say, I just felt the weight of responsibility that came with that. And uh, like to really be able to carve out the time and the space in my life to give to someone else. So it kind of took a bit of time for me to reconcile with myself and just go, look, you do have things to offer. It isn't about going, you should be doing this and you should be doing that. It's about talking and, you know, coming up with ideas for that person and, you know, just finding out about them and, and like I say, what makes them tick, what motivates them, where they want to be. And then using my experience to go, well, you could try this and you could try that. And maybe if you tried that, that could be a good idea. So it was, it was less kind of, um, What's the word? 
like it, it was never like a solid answer because that's not life anyway. There's no yes or no answers, especially in a creative industry. Um, but the things that I did start doing to sort of uh, make myself feel a little more um, prepared. And again, it's a big thing of respect of the, the position that I put myself in. I started studying a psychology degree two years ago. So just to kind of make sure that I did have, you know, I'm still studying it now. I will continue to study it, but um, it just to give myself even more information so that, yeah, like I said, I don't take it lightly, the kind of what I'm giving to people. And, and I want to make sure that it's, there is, although the majority is based in my experience, there is also an element of scientific study and research and kind of like, you know, it's not just me going, hi, I think this. And it's like, yeah, but so what? Like, that's your experience. That's fine. That's valid. But there needs to be another element of like actual hard evidence, as it were. And obviously that's always changing. There's always new research being done. It helps that I am fascinated by psychology and peak performance and, you know, um, all that sort of stuff. Uh, so, yeah, anyway, that's I'm not even sure what you just asked me. <laughs> I've sort of gone down this train of thought, but yeah. Yeah. Damn it, you're impressive. I must say that. <laughs> you're very kind. I'm not. I'm just. I'm a little bit mad. <laughs> no. I'll tell you what. So I had this really interesting conversation with, um, it was actually, I'll tell you who it was. It was, do you know Charisse Osei, the drummer? So she plays with Simple Minds. That's and... your friend Charisse, right? Yes. Okay. So we grew up together and uh, I happened to uh, see her dad the other day, who I haven't seen for ages. And I adore him. He's just wonderful. All of her family are wonderful. And um, we were catching up. We were chatting about stuff and he went, do you know what, Emily, you're the only person that I know who thrives on like chaos. So when things go wrong, most people go a little scared and I don't. My initial reaction is always, okay, wow, options. There's opportunity here, like, let, let, like change. Excellent. Let's see what can come from this. And I thought that that was completely normal. And Eddie, Sharice's dad, sort of said that to me. And I was like, hmm, that's weird. Like, I've never thought about it. It's never even crossed my mind. But it is how I react to things. You know, if, say, uh, for instance, the COVID thing, when that happened, it was like, okay, what, what new fun stuff can I concentrate on now that I have all this space and time that is, is free? Um, and, I, and then I spoke to my dad the following day. And again, Sharice was there as well. And I said... I was asking, I was going, so Eddie was saying to me about the fact that I kind of really enjoy when opportunities come up, you know, when things happen, bad things in inverted commas, inverted commas uh, happen, and I see it as opportunity. And my dad went, oh, yes, yeah, brilliant. There's nothing better than when you throw cards up in the air and then you just have to let them fall and see what happens. And I was like, right, this is why I am the way that I am, is because my family have that same attitude of like, Things are going to happen, but then you don't know what's going to happen in a beautiful way. Like something incredible can come from an inherently bad situation. And obviously there's exceptions to that. And I'm not, you know, uh, I'm not saying that there aren't actual just bad situations. But I think when things seem chaotic and things out of your control kind of happen, like coming off of a gig, you know, maybe an artist decides they want to retire, that's it, your gig's gone, or maybe you get fired off, a gig, off of a gig or whatever. I just go, cool, I have space now. That's really interesting. I wonder what's going to happen. I wonder what's going to come up. So, um, and then if, if things don't, I start making stuff for myself. <laughs> I start going, right, let me fill my time. <laughs> so yeah, that's kind of how I look at things. And as I said, I, I thought this was I thought a lot of people thought this way, but I'm, I recently found out maybe I'm not in the majority there. <laughs> I don't know. Anyway, hopefully that gives you some insight. I don't, I don't know everybody in the world, but that's such a healthy approach. It's, and it's not my approach, by the way. Um, okay. I, I have not been shy about talking about being in therapy, which I have been for several years now. I'm in therapy too. I yeah. think it's the most wonderful thing ever and everyone should have therapy at least at some point in their life. It's great. Uh, it's And it's not even as though I went into therapy for like mental health problems or anything. I was just trying to figure myself out, right? It's yeah. just like it's speaking to someone who has an educated and objective view. <laughs> you can't, yeah. it's like a fish can't see the water it's in, you know what I mean? Absolutely. Um, so I, I went in for that reason, but 
along comes the pandemic and I mean, what music was to me fundamentally went away. Like the artists that I was playing with went off, they moved elsewhere. Like I, in a lot of ways I was starting again at zero and I had no income and I had nothing happening. And it was just like a kind of a, a rock bottom situation. And so I'm chatting with my therapist and I say to her that life right now feels like kind of standing on the edge of a dark alley with just a little street light hanging and I'm scared to go down that alley and I don't know what to do. And she looked at me like I had two heads. <laughs> really? I totally understand. You're saying it to me and I'm going, yep. Yeah, yep. but but her <laughs> her approach it was no, this is the edge of a wide open field. This is not a wow. dark alley. I mean, I mean, I'm sitting there like, I don't know what to do or what I'm supposed to do. Yeah. Her answer is, there's nothing but possibility now. You know, yeah. and like my default setting is not to look at it that way. Where yeah. yours is. But it wasn't always. No? I will say it, it wasn't always. Yeah, this is not like, yes, I was brought up to sort of try and think that way, but. I realized that when I was younger, I very much was the person that was looking down the alley and it was scary and it was like, I don't know what's going to happen and I feel like I'm going to fall over and I feel like I'm going to look stupid or I'm going to fail or, you know, and all these overwhelming experiences, uh, sorry, feelings that would render me completely paralyzed and I would end up just not doing anything because I was so scared of mainly being found out as it were, as a complete imposter in what I was doing. You know, I mean, it was at a time where I was sort of just out of school and I was trying to make it as a professional and, and just trying to almost keep up the facade of being a professional without actually being a professional so that people would hire me as a professional, if that makes any sort of sense. Oh, yeah, for sure. So, yeah, so it kind of was this fear of like, if I don't know, if I don't have all the answers all the time, if I don't do the job perfectly, then I'm going to, I'm going to fail. You know, one person's going to find out the beacon's going to go out and everyone in the music industry is going to realize that I'm not good enough. And then nobody's going to call me. This was my train of thought. And it was horrendous and completely useless and completely untrue. A, perfectionism doesn't exist. So I had to kind of get my head around that. And also like I was 18 years old. You shouldn't have all the information at 18. Like it's just, you know, retrospectively, you look back and you go, my God, I was putting so much pressure on myself. No wonder I couldn't physically do anything. You know, I would just sit and go, I don't know what to practice. I don't know. I don't want to go out. You know, I because again, just being found out, I, I don't want to play. I don't want to do this. I don't want to do that. And it was kind of fighting myself daily to try and get, like make moves where I wanted to be whilst being absolutely terrified of actually getting there. So I do understand that kind of way of thinking and, and it's it's horrible because the worst thing is it's all your brain. <laughs> it's like often 99.999% of the time there isn't any evidence to actually show that that is what the truth is and it's about finding those other bits of evidence to counteract that way of thinking and that's what I did when I first I first went to CBT uh, therapy when I was um, so cognitive behavioral therapy for people that don't know um when I was 20 I think and that was when the shift started for me because it was about sort of challenging this idea that I wasn't good enough which was the basis of everything for me it was always I'm not good enough and everything that came along with that so it became about finding evidence of things that I you know not that I was good at because that was too much of a jump but it was like okay what am I not terrible at all right so cooking because I love food so okay I can cook I guess I can cook a little bit and that was literally I remember distinctly that was where it started for me and then it my life became about challenging all those things that I was telling myself when I was you know out and about somewhere or playing a gig or meeting someone new or whatever when I heard that voice in my head going oh no you can't do that I would have a counter voice that would go, well, why don't I just do an experiment? Why don't I actually challenge that? Let's just do the thing and just see what happens. So there was no sort of onus on it. It was just like, let's just see. And as I say, often you would find that actually the opposite would be true of what your brain was telling you. And that was another bit of evidence. So, oh, no. OK. All right. 
yeah, no, this is okay. All right, let's try something else. So it, it I mean, it's been a process and it's, it's still a process for me. So I don't know whether that resonates with you as well. <laughs> oh, it does. A hundred percent it does. Because, I mean, you have to approach your brain with a certain amount of compassion because your brain, your ego really are trying to protect you, right? So if you're frightened Absolutely. of a situation, it's about self-preservation. It, it's, a, it's a tender kind of thing. But yeah. I mean, your brain has trained over generations to find threat, fear it, avoid it. And yeah. <laughs> at we've <all> done <laughs> at all costs. And we've done that successfully as a species for hundreds of thousands of years. So you're working against a lot of conditioning there. Yeah. But it's like, you eventually have to take the step to confront these things, right? Mm -hmm. And then you begin to realize, at least in my case, my stakes have been lower than yours, but even if it goes wrong, for the most part, it's okay. Yeah, it's not actually that bad. No. And you can survive all of it, like, unless you actually die. But I'm presuming right. that you can't really dr die from trying to be a drummer, like a professional drummer. I've never seen it. So Spinal Tap, I don't know, maybe. Well, this is true, yeah, no, you're right, actually. I've spoken too soon there, haven't I? <laughs> don't jinx it, man. Yeah, sorry, sorry, I'm touching wood right now, so that, uh, <laughs> yeah, it doesn't happen. But yeah, you're right, you're right. And even if the worst does happen, it's never as bad as you think it's going to be, and it's always salvageable. And also, we're human, <laughs> and it's okay to falter. And actually, in a lot of scenarios, that humanness when you let people see that it makes you be able to connect with them better and you don't want to be the perfect person because nobody nobody wants to be around that perfect person no, I, it just I hate makes perfect their, people exactly they're so dull no they're not dull but you know they, they don't exist but they you know you want someone with those quirks you know we all have our own scars in our own way but those are the things that make us really interesting i think it's it's you know, it's the things that drive us. And, and I always remember someone saying to me that, you know, especially with um, creative people, often they, they would say, this probably sounds really horrendous, but I really like this idea. So people that are incredibly creative, we have a part of our brain that is missing. And it's that part that makes us so interesting and be able to create the art that we do. And I thought that's such an interesting way to look at it, because if you do meet artists, especially, you know, sometimes they may act or react in a way that you're like, that makes no sense to me. But then you go, and that's what makes them an artist is kind of the trade off. There's always a trade off. There's always something that you have to compromise in some way or another. And I think becoming OK with that and comfortable with the fact that you're not perfect, you're not going to be perfect, you have flaws it's it becomes very freeing and once you're aware of it you know you don't have to stop it but it's nice to notice it and go ah that's that that's why i'm reacting like that that's why i'm feeling like that and and these are things that i'm still working through in therapy but it's a it's a fascinating I, I i just find it fascinating i find it fascinating just um learning about myself and then consequently learning about other people and and how they react to things too you know it's really uh yeah, it's super interesting. I think it's interesting. <laughs> I think as a creative person as well, it's really important to own that part of yourself. Yes. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like I've had to go through this as a drummer. We've probably talked about this off and on before. About like I've really so much value simplicity in drumming. That's what my focus is. But the pressure outside in the social media world is the opposite, right? Yeah. <laughs> it's it's chop a minute stuff. It's stuff that I not only don't do, I'm not all that interested in doing. And so I'm, I I come also from a position of not being good enough and I came very late to the party and so I've always felt a little bit self-conscious about that. And then over the course of the last 10 years I've had to reconcile and then own this notion that I play the drums simply. Yeah. <laughs> that's what I like. That's what I value. And it's, it's a beautiful it, thing. <laughs> it's not going to be for everybody and it's not going to be for every gig. I think you've got to cultivate the faith that what you do has its own signature and that it will find the place where it fits. Yeah. You know, you put this pressure on yourself to be a drummer of all trades, to be able to do everything. And then you lose your mind because you can't. Yeah. Vin, Vinnie Coliuta can, maybe. 
most you of know, us can't. There's always exceptions to the rule, but yeah, right? no, it's true. And I think that actually something that I also realized, because I remember growing up and, and, you know, I'm sure a lot of people can relate to this. When I knew I wanted to be a drummer, my whole life was drums. It was like, that is it, nothing else. Mm. But as I've grown older, actually, it's all the other stuff that you bring into your life and your consequently your playing and whatever else is the thing that makes you rounded as a musician. It is the fact that I'm fascinated by psychology and people's stories. It's the fact that, you know, obviously we both have a podcast and doing all that sort of stuff. And it's actually all those things that make us interesting as a player. And it doesn't necessarily translate into physical notes, but it does translate into feel it, the feeling behind the notes that we play. I don't know if that sounds a bit too sort of like existential or whatever, but I truly believe it. When I see certain players and they're playing so simply, but there's so much emotion and feeling behind what they're doing that it hits you in a way that is just like just unbelievable you know there are specific gigs that I've been to and I just remember feeling like that and just being bowled over and going how are you doing this to me and and I can play what you're playing physically but I can't play the way that you're playing right now and it's all the life experience behind them and a lot of that is not to do with the drums inherently it's to do with life experience it's to do with heartbreak it's to do with love and you know friendship and experiences and and I think that's one of my favorite things about music is sort of learning about people in a more almost holistic way I, I don't know if that's the right way to explain it but you know, when you connect someone with someone musically, if you're playing with them on stage and you find out more about their personality and their experience through playing with them versus talking to them, it's a really interesting experience when that happens. Um, I love it when that happens. It, it makes me so even more intrigued about them. I'm like, oh my God, I want the words to understand what your experience is because that was amazing. Whatever just happened. Wow, like that was really cool. So uh, yeah, like I say, yeah, I'm going a bit out there today. I'm in a bit of an out there mood, but uh, yeah, that's kind of how I see it. And um, there's no such thing as too out there on this podcast, <laughs> Emily. We... I, I wanted to say as well. So you said something really interesting about um, the fact that you're a very you you feel that you're a very simple player. You know, I know that you play for the song, which obviously you know I love. That's like my favorite thing ever, um, and. An interesting thing. So when we last spoke, I I don't think I mentioned at the time because I hadn't started it yet and I didn't want to jinx it. I would have been working up towards The Voice Kids. So it's a TV show over here in the UK. For anyone yep. that knows The Voice, it's the kids version of that. Um, and that was a massive, massive challenge for me because um, when I met up with the musical director, he said, look, a lot of this gig is reading. And my reading skills were not where they needed to be even slightly and I was like oh my god I was terrified but again in my head I was like right this is a challenge you've wanted to do this this is the perfect opportunity the other musicians on the gig are amazing so this will be a great reason to just tick off that box and go and actually learn how to read I was basically just having a go at myself when I was having this meeting with this dude but anyway <laughs> um I went and did that and you know I I got on the gig I'd, I I I basically gave myself a boot camp for 3 months of like making sure that I was so over -prepared, prepared that it wasn't going to be an issue and it wasn't and it was great and I went in and I did the job and they asked me back and I was like wicked Now an interesting byproduct of the Voice Kids gig so I've been doing it for 4 years now is that because of a number of combinations of the way the gig is so uh let's say there's 30 kids uh, singing in the blinds part of the audition, so the very first round. That will be 30 songs that cover a very wide variety of genres. So it can be rock, it can be pop, it could be gospel, it could be like Cuban, it could be jazz, it could be honestly anything, as long as it's sort of in the very, very broad scope of pop music that they can televise, basically. So ni no Nine Inch Nails, for instance, that probably wouldn't be appropriate. But the point is, because you cover so many different genres, it really would highlight to me the parts of my playing that I was most vulnerable about. Sure. And I was on stage with people that I respect immensely. And I, I want to play with these musicians for as long as I can because they are, they are so incredible and so inspiring. And they're great people as well, which helps. That's always a nice thing. Um, but going back to what you were saying about, you know, it's chops a minute on the internet and all of that. In the last season that we just filmed, I noticed that my biggest insecurity and vulnerability 
was playing without an agenda, playing just me, like drum solo, two most horrendous words I could ever hear, oh, like basically no. improvising. It filled me with dread, which I know that you completely understand. I it's do. just like, yeah, I mean, I think a lot of drummers do. And I was like, do you know what? Look, uh, sorry, this is me talking to myself. I talk to myself a lot. I was like, look, I don't like this feeling of feeling vulnerable like that. And in the context of The Voice Kids, let's say there was a, a, a song and then there would be like a, a, a two bar break and the MD would go, right, I, I want you to do a big fill in those two bars. I, I, that, even that, I'd be like, ew, horrendous. I mean, I'd do it and it'd get done, but it would never be like something I was proud of or confident in or whatever. I'd have to work on it and I'd have to, you know, make it meticulously kind of just run it, you know? And I was like, I don't like this. I don't like that in the moment I can't just play, if that makes sense, without an agenda. So I challenged myself because I very much like you identified myself as I'm not a chops player. I don't improvise. I don't do drum solos and all these sort of like things that were blocking me off from opportunities. And I just thought, no, I don't like that. I want to, I want to challenge this. Like it's time to face this. And this is a lifelong thing that I've been battling against. So I decided to start playing for 30 minutes a day, just with silence, just me, just drums. And I've been doing it for about eight months now. And can I tell you, like, it has opened up my eyes and my world. And I'm not saying that this means I'm going to be going out doing drum solos every day and, <laughs> and whatever, but just feeling safe in the knowledge that actually I can do that. And like, why not? And it kind of like breaks those barriers around what you think you can be. And as I say, I'm still a song drummer. It's where my heart lies. I love it the most. I love playing simply like you. Um, but just knowing that I'm not going to get caught out in a situation where I suddenly feel so vulnerable that actually I freeze or, you know what I mean? And just turn into the drummer that I'm not. It's just really interesting. But I thought you might appreciate that kind of way of thinking of just challenging it and going, actually, what if I could do that? And just, just to see again, like an experiment, let's just see, like, Maybe you can be that person if you just allow yourself the space and the grace to kind of just be an experiment and have fun with it and not put too much pressure on being a chops drummer or a solo drummer or whatever and just kind of let it flow. But it's been it's been very interesting. It's been a very interesting experience. But yeah, I think what you're frightened of is important. Mm. I mean, those are those are guideposts, right? Definitely. <laughs> and I think everybody's capable of far more than they realize. And it's important to confront those. It's very easy to get set in your ways, right? Yeah. It's very, very easy to, it's like I play two and four and I play this genre of music and, and some people make a wonderful career out of that and it it's works true. great for them. Yeah. Most people need more than that or, or have the ambition. That's the wrong word. A lot of people can be a lot better than they realize if they just go into those areas that, and it helps to have a teacher to push you into areas you might not even know exist, you know? Absolutely. So tackling a weakness that way is a really mature and important thing to do. And it, it opens up way more than just if the MD throws down a two bar break, I can fill it. Yeah. Your confidence around it. You probably have unlocked some ideas in your playing that you've had, yep. didn't realize we're there, you know, because you maybe you hear something in your head and you go to execute that, and it's like I I don't have the sticking, I don't have the whatever. That's it. Yeah. Oh, there's Language. another. There's yeah, yeah. There's another thing to add to the. You know, it's it's just a really mature thing to do. But going back to your, this is a practical question. What did your reading boot camp look like? How did you approach that? Because I'm not okay. a great reader either, so I'm curious. Oh, you're not. Well, the first thing I would definitely recommend is booking yourself like a gig where you have to read because you, you can't read. get out of it. And then it's just like, well, this is happening whether I'm ready or not. And it, that's a big motivator for me. But that's because I'm sadistic and a bit, yeah, like I say, extreme. Um, so my boot camp, it was, it was basically like say three months and. Uh, on at the beginning of each month, I would um, record myself playing uh, the previous season's songs with the charts. So the previous season had already happened. I had all that as material to reference. 
Um, so I would record these, uh, I think it was like 60 songs, um, and read them. So I did that on the first month. It was horrendous. It was awful. I just did it as it came. I was like, I need to start honestly. Um, so I recorded them all. I listened back. I basically went, oh my gosh, I'm terrified. This is horrendous. What have I done? And like, oh, and then what I did was I started out very, very simply. Um, I got an app. Um, now I'm sure you're the same as me. So the, my level of reading going into this was basically drum exercises. So like yeah. one, two or four bar exercises and you just run around and around. So that I could kind of do, but in a musical setting with like fills and stops and, and rests and blah, 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 I was like, Ugh, God, terrifying. So I started simply and I got an app that was literally just uh, one bar phrases of uh, rhythms. And mm. I would just clap them out. That would be it, literally. Um, and I did that maybe for the first week. And then after that, I started gradually getting hold of uh, drum charts online that, first of all, very simple charts, very simple charts. And I would sit down and I would read through the chart first until I felt like I knew what was going on. And then I would record it. And this would, at the beginning, that would be like one chart a day. And I'd be meticulous with it and just really work through it and understand what the rhythms were doing, what the fills were doing. And, you know, some days were better than others. Some charts were better than others. And as I say, it was all a, a mishmash of different styles of writing as well. Um, and basically, I would just gradually do that. And as I say, but every at the beginning of every month, I'd go back to those 60 songs and re-record myself and then listen again. And in that time, I was seeing progress and I was like, I'm getting better at this. OK, this is good. And then I gradually, because I had the level of charts that were written for the voice, I, I knew what level I needed to be at. But of course, me being me, I was like, right, I need to be above that level of like crazy charts so that if I can understand those, these ones are going to be easy to read and I'm going to find it easy, basically just to normalize it. So I ended up getting these crazy written charts that were so intricate like every ghost note and every you know what i mean right. so that on the page it was like a lot of information but then actually distilling it down to what this what it actually was if that makes sense because mm -hmm. as you work out with reading you know it's not always about playing every note that's on the chart it's more about sort of not getting the essence of it but you know you can leave some bits out you don't need to play every ghost note on a on a beat you know it's it's not about that you still have to have musicality and 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 understand like your instincts as a musician um, so yeah, so anyway, and I just, I just did this for three months until the point I was playing these absolutely mental charts, which to be honest, I could probably not play now, but I knew that going in, whatever they put in front of me is not going to be as hard as that. So that's fine. And every day I would just be recording myself and listening back and recording myself and listening back and just gradually seeing that progress. And actually it, it, it wasn't as difficult as I thought it would be. And going back to what we spoke about earlier, I'd built it up in my head that it was this massive mountain to climb. But actually, once I started just, you know, putting a foothold in and, and climbing, I was to the top a lot quicker than I thought I'd be. And actually, it ended up being really fun. And now I feel so... Oh, I don't know. My whole world has opened up. It sounds ridiculous, but once I learned to read and once I was in those rehearsals, I was like an advocate. I was like, this reading thing is brilliant. Why isn't everyone doing it? I mean, we all just literally come in, sit down, play the song. It sounds great. Move on. Next song. Amazing. And, you know, so it's it's really opened up my world. And it, again, in possibilities, it's the same thing with this sort of soloing improvisation thing. I feel like my world has opened up just a little bit more and more opportunities are now available to me. And if they come my way, I it, my insecurity won't be there to make me go, oh, no, 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 don't do that because you can't do that. And not just in the physical thing of reading or improvisation, but anything. Because now I think, okay, maybe I can't do, let's say, Cuban music, which I really can't. But now I have the experience to know that, okay, I can't do it right now. But that's not to say that I couldn't work on it and get to a point with it. I'm not saying I would play as kind of like authentically as someone who was brought up in Cuba, Cuba playing every day. But what I am saying is that I could put a dent in it, you know what I mean? And that, that in itself is a really empowering uh, experience just to know that, oh no, I can do things that I thought I could never do and would never be able to do. So that in itself is, is very valuable to me. It's interesting how momentum works, right? When you start yeah. to shatter some of these things, 
the next yeah. ones get easier and easier and easier, right? Exactly, exactly. And when you start realizing that the only person that ever told me that I couldn't do these things was me. It was you. What an idiot. <laughs> uh, no, it's, it's just a human, that's all. <laughs> it's true, it's, it's true. Just We're human. all so harsh on ourselves. It's, um, it's the blessing and the curse. It's the reason that we are good at what we do. It's because we're that harsh on ourselves. And, and it, In some and ways, yeah. And we want to be good. But with that comes a lot of negative side that we've obviously spoken about. And yeah, it's the blessing and the curse, isn't it, John? <laughs> it is the blessing and the curse. What's filming like for the voice kids? Like, what, What's a day in the life of the house drummer on that show? It's... it's... <laughs> the most surreal experience really? I've ever had yeah so not least because obviously sat in front of me are the four judges who are Will I Am who is fascinating as a human uh, a guy called Danny Jones who is guitarist from McFly who is an absolute sweetheart um, he's kind of like all the boys that I used to be in bands with when I was a kid. So I get on really well with him. I'm like, oh yeah, but you're my kind of people. Um, and then you've got uh, Pixie Lot, who is this lovely, um, she's a singer. She's essentially like a living Disney princess. She's oh, wow. just so sweet. And then, um, and then the fourth judge has changed over the years. So one year we had Paloma Faith. Another year we had Melanie C from the Spice Girls. Wow. Uh, and then the last two years we've had Ronan Keating, who used to be in a band called Boyzone, and he's now a solo artist and stuff like that. So, um, so yeah, not least because you're sat in front of those judges, which is surreal. I mean, Will I Am is the most surreal one because I'm like, this is so weird. What a cool thing. But then you find yourself in situations where, for instance, I've watched Will I Am try to play the bagpipes or they're all, tr they're tr a kid is trying to teach all the judges how to do Irish dancing or one of the other kids is a trainee, like, cadet police officer so decides that she wants to arrest Pixie Lot. I mean, it's just these weird moments that you go, my life is very strange right now and I'm <laughs> loving it and I'm living for this. Um, so those are interesting. And then the actual filming days aside from that are very, I mean, they couldn't be more opposite to my regular sort of gigging life because they're long days. They're usually like 12 hour days. You'll do two uh, filming sessions basically um, with some lunch or dinner in between depending. But you basically have the situation where First of all, you're getting all the audience in uh, and then you're um, waiting for the coaches to come out. Now, whilst we're waiting for the coaches to come out, you have an audience full of kids and we'll often get up kids from the audience to just play a random song. So a kid will come up, go to the MD and go, do you know this song? Whatever it is, I don't know, a pink <laughs> song. Um, and the MD will go, yeah, I reckon we could busk that. So he'll just sort of like <laughs> say over the talk about like, guys, uh, this song and, and, and like, as long as, I don't know, three quarters of the band know it then we're playing it and it's just like what well, we'll be all right yeah okay come then <laughs> and so it's kind of like this weird busking session so that's how the whole thing starts which is so much fun and I thrive on that sort of flying on the seat of my pants thing I, I really enjoy it I, I love the again the chaos I just who knows what might happen? I just adore it. Um, I mean, it's stressful, but in a nice way. Um, <laughs> so anyway, so that happens for maybe like half an hour and it gets all the audience settled and, you know, we're having a laugh. So that's good. And then we get the coach song. And then the way that it runs is each kid will come out. Uh, we will play their song and their songs are always like uh, versions of a popular song. So it will be like a minute and a half or a minute and 40 of a song that we've kind of edited together. It might be in a different style. It might be in the original style or whatever. And then there'll be 30 minutes of like or 20 minutes of chat between the kid and the judges, whether they've turned or not. It doesn't matter. They'll chat to them and find out a bit about them. Like say, this is why we end up with Will I Am playing bagpipes or whatever. Um, <laughs> And that's what you do for the whole day. Now, that means that you're playing for a minute and a half and then you're sat there for half an hour, right. which is, and, and you have to be engaged as well because that's the other thing. Sometimes the judges will randomly, randomly be like, oh, guys, do you know this song? And then we've got all the judges up singing some random, I don't know, living on a prayer or something. I'm like, well, okay, yeah, we all know that. That's fine. Um, <laughs> but a lot of the time it is just sitting, watching, engaging, listening to what the judges are saying to the kids. Um, 
And that's for 30 minutes. And then it's like, right, now you're all like cooled down and relaxed. Right, go, next song. And it's like, whoa. And right. sometimes it's fine when you're doing like a chilled out jazz thing. Fine, you know. But when you're going straight into like a Foo Fighters tune from zero and it's a minute and a half. So you've got all the most energetic bits of that song. Of course, of course. Yeah. It's it's a lot. And, and you know, it's I'll tell you what it's like. It's kind of like interval training, but for drumming. Right. It's mad. And you've got a switch as well, like switch your whole way of thinking. Like I say, if you are going from brushes doing a jazz tune to a Foo Fighters tune, and then maybe, as I say, I don't know, like an R&B tune, it's like your whole way of thinking and playing might be completely different. You know, going from a country tune where it's very like, swampy and like loose and whatever but then you have to go straight to a gospel tune and that the playing has to be very angular and very tight so it's just a complete shift of how you play how you're hearing things where you place the notes and all that stuff very abruptly do you know what i mean so um i mean like i say i thrive on it i really enjoy it uh it's it's crazy but it i uh, I shouldn't say this because I don't mean this in any disrespect to any other gig I've ever done in my life. I think it's my favorite gig I've ever done because it suits my personality uh, down to the ground. <laughs> what a great training exercise too. I mean, what what can you not handle in a live setting really after, Once you've done that. after that, right? Oh, dude. Oh, I'll tell you a funny thing that happened on the last thing. So we just finished up filming in... Um, August, the new season's actually coming out on the 1st of July over here in the UK. Uh, and I had a new thing happen. So we were recording the, the coaches do like an opening number to open the whole season for the, for that year. And we'd done one take and I was, I was listening to my snare and I was like, why does my snare sound so weird? This is so weird. It feels, it just sounds odd. And the bass player was going, yeah, there's something weird about the sound right now. And everyone else was going, I don't know what you're talking about. Like, it sounds great to me. And I was like, no, no, you know, when you know in your gut, like something is not right here. And I was like, maybe it's the tuning's weird. Da, 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 da. And I thought maybe one of the lugs has come out on the bottom head. Cause that's often the thing for me. Cause I have them quite loose and something. Anyway, I go underneath and the whole of my bottom side of my snare had split and i was oh. like and we have to record the, the opening number like that's the second run of it like now so i was like no 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 my snare split i need help i need help and like yeah. da, 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 like this like military operation and i was like oh this is brilliant like the chaos the chaos <laughs> and anyway we got it sorted but um yeah literally it, it's the kind of gig where Anything can happen and it will happen and it's always fun. Um, I don't think so far, touch wood, and nothing's happened that is catastrophic. It's been a few moments where it's like, oh, oh, that wasn't great. That, that wasn't great, but it's okay. We, we all survived. Nobody died. So that's fine. Um, but on the whole, it's like I say, it's the mixture of material, the way that it runs, the people involved. The whole experience is just so fulfilling for me. It's um, it's fantastic. I That's adore great. it. Yeah, very lucky. Very very lucky. So, you keep your bottom head tuned fairly loose on your snare. Is that what you just said to me? Well, let me talk you through it. <laughs> this is for so this depends. is a section for the drummers. Okay, go. Yeah, sorry, all the non-drummers. I'm about to get geeky for a second, but not for very long. So it really depends. I'll either have the bottom head super tight even all round and that's usually with my metal snares um like my 402 or whatever that works really well however there's another very specific tuning that i do that this is how this drum was tuned where it's the same everything's pretty tight on the bottom head aside from the four lugs either side of the snare bed okay. so those four uh, lugs are completely detuned and then the snare itself i I sort of, uh, I mess around with it, but it's fairly loose. So it rests against the lo the slackened part of the head, if that makes sense. Yep. And it kind of gives this really nice, warm, deep kind of tone to it. It sounds brilliant until the bottom head splits. Then oh, it sounds yeah. horrendous. But that's the first time that's ever happened to me. It was a bit of a shock. It was a bit of a shock. I'm not going to lie. <laughs> so yeah, that's why. And there was no backup snare at the ready. Did you have to replace that head? No, there was a backup okay. snare, but it just wasn't as good as the as I the see. main snare. So then I was like, "Oh, this sucks! I'm so annoyed at myself. Like this sucks." And then, but the the tech went away and managed to swap out the bottom head before the third run. I think we did. So I mean, 
God help if they use a mixture of takes one, two, and three. Right. But, uh, like, what's yeah, going on with to... that snare? Yeah, what's going on? <laughs> Although I do always get compliments with my snare drum sound from the sound guys, which I'm always well pleased with myself about. I'm like, oh, yeah. I'm well, proud you know what? That's cool. <laughs> I, I have been listening to the record that you recorded with The Darkness, oh. uh, The Last of Us. And that drum sound. The drum sound, I was going to say <sighs> to you, man. I'd love to say that that has much to do with me, but. It has a little to do with me, but mostly to do with Dan Hawkins. With Dan Hawkins. He, he produced and engineered that album. And oh my God, I wish I was running my studio and understood more about recording when I was in that room with him because mm. I would have been there with a notepad taking notes. That drum sound is one of my favorite drum sounds. I think it's phenomenal. It's really great. Oh, I yeah. agree with you. I agree. <laughs> I, yeah. I, yeah, it's Dan. It's Dan. It's not even me. It's just, you know, I just play. I just hit the things. But uh, yeah, wow. He did an amazing job with that. The whole of that album, I think, just sounds brilliant. It sounds so big and full and just it does, but weighty. It, it doesn't sound processed. No. Right? Like it. There's a rawness to it, though, that still comes through, especially yeah. on that snare drum sound. As soon as I heard, was listening to the first <laughs> song, I'm like, the snare is incredible. <laughs> yeah, that's my uh, acrylate that is over behind me. Oh, really? So, yeah, yeah, I love that snare drum. I use it on so many recordings. Right. I can't even tell you. It just sounds brilliant. It cost me like 90 quid, and it's just the most versatile, beautiful snare. Um, and like I say, and Dan captured that that drum sound so incredibly that, I mean, to the point that, I'll tell you, I don't know if I told you this story before, but... Uh, that snare drum. So I tuned it in such a way and we were recording and it was sounding amazing. And I was like, oh, I'm so happy with this sound. Like, let that continue. And then on the very last song, I think, or maybe the uh, last but one, I noticed that the snare had started to go. And I was like, oh no, this snare drum's going to go. And then I'm not going to be able to, like, I'm going to have to put a new head on it and it's not going to sound it's as good. And then, the same. What am I going to do? <laughs> Anyway, I managed to finish the album with that one snare drum head, but it's a it's a two ply head, and the first ply of the head has got I've still got it. It had a split all the way down the middle of it, and I was still playing it just to finish the album with this snare drum sound. I was like, I have to do it. I can't I can't jeopardize this. But um, yeah, and I've still got the the drum head upstairs uh, in my house because I just thought I managed to finish the whole album when oh. that head wanted to break so bad. The momentous. So you must. You must hit pretty hard, therefore, to be I, cracking I, snare drum heads. I guess so, yeah. I've I, never broken a snare drum head. Oh, haven't you? No. I mean, it doesn't happen often. I play singer-songwriter music. I play a little, you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, I mean, in fairness, I don't, I don't break snare drum heads when I'm sort of recording in the studio or whatever, but I suppose on that album, I was really hitting hard. And I think at that time, I was also playing with... The uh, my left hand stick playing with the butt of the stick just okay. to give it some extra kind extra of uh, weight. Heft. Um, so yeah, exactly. Which uh, yeah, maybe the snare drum head did not like that. But um, yeah, I I don't often break snare drum heads or heads generally. Even though I've just told you two stories where both top and bottom head have broken. So maybe this is not true now that I'm reflecting. <laughs> I feel like if you're gonna break a snare drum head, you should be playing with the darkness. This is true. I mean, it's on brand. It's definitely on brand. Right? A hundred percent agree. Yeah. I totally. I have I've revisited the darkness since last we talked, and yeah. it's a lot to do with with Justin's YouTube channel, which has blown up. I don't know if you've been yeah. watching it or not. I've seen a couple of bits. It looks amazing. What he's doing. I'm so happy for him that he's sort of like getting gaining this traction with it. It's amazing. It's so good. Oh, he's really good at it. I mean, we know he has a personality. <laughs> yes, he does. Twenty four seven. That is him. He is exactly as you see and hear him. He's. Uh, I love that about him. He's very just. This is me. You know. And and just him is pretty entertaining and. But insightful too. Like that cat knows a lot about music and he's had a lot oh, yeah. of experiences. Definitely. And so in addition to, of course, listening to the record you made with them, Permission to Land is oh, such a good album. It's one of the great debuts of all time. I mean, easily, easily. When I went to go and audition for them and I was learning 
in fact, was it for the audition or was it afterwards? Anyway, when I was learning that album, I was just like, every song on there is just brilliant, but yeah. for different reasons. Like they've each got their own like vibe, but it's so locked in. Do you know what I mean? It's it's committed. It's a like Oh, I just, I just think it's great. It's just really, really brilliant. The, the subsequent albums are really great as well, and there's yeah. a lot of really interesting songs. But as a cohesive, like you say, debut album, it's just, I don't know. I just think, yeah, there's something really special about that album. Oh, Definitely. yeah, it, it's magic. And it was such a breath of fresh air when it came out too. Yeah. Like it was a, mo a moment in time where this, this band straight out of the 70s just stepped into the <laughs> world and just yeah. blew people away. Like it was... Yeah really fun and it came along at a time when music really needed something yeah in my opinion a, i i agree with you i re i remember distinctly the first time i ever saw it was the video uh for i believe in a thing called love and i remember i was in a rehearsal room uh with a heavy metal band and i just remember taking notice and i don't often remember moments like that like i have very few moments where i just remember the first time going oh my god what's that um, one other one would be Soundgarden's uh, Black Hole Sun the first time I really? saw that video and heard that song and I was like oh! I was actually quite scared if I'm honest because I was quite young but the music <laughs> I was like what is this this is incredible I just love this um, so yeah it's interesting those moments that you sort of reflect back on and you go god yeah I, re I remember that I remember distinctly interesting that yeah I, I have um, I have an awkward relationship with that whole grunge scene okay because I'm just Go old. Go on, tell me more. Now, I well, want to know more. I mean, the, the listeners of my show, this is not new to them, but I mean, my age is such that my teenage years were spent in the late 80s, early 90s. So they were spent listening to Cinderella records and like glam metal stuff. Like the, Amazing. The whole hard rock glam metal thing was where I grew up. When I started right. playing drums... It was a double kick pedal and five toms and the new <laughs> Slaughter record. And that was my world, right? Yeah. And so Soundgarden, Nirvana, Pearl Jam, et cetera, all that stuff took, like away, that. My, took away my world. It, it, yeah. It, it killed it, you know? So I can I, understand. <laughs> I never embraced those bands. But the great irony is that my favorite band on planet Earth is King's X. And I don't know if you li have listened to King's X or not. But King's X is considered by many the godfathers of the grunge scene. Oh, really? So the Sound Gardens and Pearl Jams of the world yeah. were very influenced by King's X. But I I can't listen to them, and yet King's X is my favorite. It's just a I'm a strange person too. Like no, my, no, I I I do understand what you're saying because you want to. I'm the same. When I like a band. Um, if they're the root of another offshoot of a band, I, it doesn't mean I'm going to like that offshoot. And yeah, actually, I'm not resent them, but like, no, 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 no. You should be listening to them. You should be listening <laughs> to the original because they're amazing. But then you start going further and further back. And actually, it's just like, oh, no, but they were influenced by these guys. They right. were influenced by these guys. Right. So I end up going the other way, if that makes sense. Like yeah, just weird. delving backwards. But I, I do appreciate that train of thought because I have had that train of thought. I'm just like... No, no, if you want to listen to what they're trying to do, they're trying to be this band. <laughs> it's so silly and it's so snobby, but oh, it, it is. happens. Like, it do is. you know what I mean? <laughs> so you're not alone there. <laughs> Who do you listen to now? I mean, do you get chances to listen casually to music or are you just too busy recording everybody? Yeah, I've, I'll be honest. I, I don't listen to music that much. And when I do, it's often for nostalgia purposes. Um, recently, I've been listening a lot to Lewis Taylor. I don't know if you know him. He's a UK artist from sort of the, I think it's like the late, late 90s. I got into him late. Um, and yeah, he's kind of a sort of dark, not quite singer songwriter, but anyway, he's great. He's, I really like him. Um, more sort of recent stuff. People like Moses Sumney, I really like, mm. uh, who's a, a singer songwriter kind of guy, um, who has a, the most stunning voice and lyrically is beautiful. Uh, John Paul White, I love, who is one half of the Civil Wars. His songwriting is just, I love his songwriting. It's some of my favorite. Um, but yeah, it's I often I'm often listening for nostalgia reasons rather than seeking out new music because I find that obviously 
because I'm recording all the time, I'm constantly listening to like right. new music, which is great. And I love it. And it feeds me. And I, I just, oh, I love hearing people's stories and, and especially if I can be part of it, obviously. Um, so sometimes actually what I need is the grounding back to the things that I love the most and the things that resonate with, with me the most. But in all honesty, I, I don't often listen to music sort of around the house. I'm, I'm the person that's uh, listening more to like audiobooks and podcasts and things like mm. that because my whole life is spent sort of listening to music and learning music. And I was yeah. telling my friend this the other day. He's not in music, but uh, I sort of was trying to explain to him that it's sort of it's the great irony of being a musician is that you get into music because you love music like so much so intensely you go to gigs and you watch it and you're mesmerized and then you actually get into music and you kind of you work out the mechanics of it and you lift the curtain on it and you mm. understand it from the other side and it actually takes away the magic of why you got into it in the first place if that makes sense i get it and yeah yeah, it's it's a funny thing because it doesn't make you love it any less, but the magic of it kind of dissipates a little bit. And, and that's what I get from going back and uh, listening to nostalgic things that I listened to before I started playing the drums. And I can feel that magic still a little bit. Mm. But I guess it's the same if you become a magician. It's learning the tricks. You go, well, it's not magic thing. anymore. Yeah, yeah exactly. Because that's something I really enjoy, like magic and illusions and mentalism. I love all that. And in another lifetime, I'd probably go down that route of finding out about that because it's fascinating. But I know from my experience that I don't want to lose that, like, wow, sort of thing. Uh, um, interesting. So I probably never will. But, uh, yeah, it's interesting. It's, it's like I say, it's so ironic that you get into something because of that magic. But then by virtue, you end up not destroying that magic. That sounds so intense, but... It becomes a different thing. It becomes a different thing when it becomes your job, you know, but I still love it. You approach things differently. Like, yeah, I'll, I'll go to a show now and a lot of the time, instead of being absorbed in the music, I'll be thinking about how they're making that sound or, yeah. you know what I mean? Like totally. Or like watching the tech run across and going, oh, what's happening there? Like, oh, is something oh, yeah. wrong? oh, something's going on with the drummer there. Like, I don't know what's happening, but he's not happy. I can see on his face that he is not happy. <laughs> yeah, so you're noticing all these things that other people are just, yeah, the music yeah. is great. But you're like, oh, exactly. what's, what's happening there? Like, my favorite yeah. <laughs> place to be at a show is actually on the stage. Like, uh, uh, you, I'm sure you've totally. had... Not even just playing. Like, just being... No. Like, I'm sure you've had this experience many times. Just, we're playing the same festival, so we get to be kind of yeah. around... And you're side stage and you're watching what's going on behind the scenes. Like that yeah. for me is still utterly fascinating, right? Oh, totally. I love that. Because they, oh, it's just watching the dynamics between people. And yeah. like, I love seeing people chatting on stage and like inside jokes that are going on. And I love all that because it's, yeah, that's like, I guess that is the other side of the professional side of it. It's like the new magic where you're kind of in it and you're, you become part of this sort of club i suppose of people that do what we do yeah. and um you just i don't know there's just a real joy to that and i think often i find that everyone that is in that sort of scenario say it's a festival we're all just kind of there going huh we're getting away with this aren't we like we get to do what we love like oh my god like are we lucky wow. so it's kind of like an in joke of like i can't believe we're all getting away with this still um and there's something really beautiful in that because it it makes you appreciate it and especially going back to the covid thing especially after all the covid thing oh like yeah going back to playing live was like a religious experience i'm not religious but that was that was overwhelming like and and also wow how unfit did i feel the first time coming off a stage i, I was bet. like wow this is what two years of not playing is uh not yeah. playing live is is done to me what was your first gig back like do you remember how it felt or were you still in a bit of a haze about it at the time I played a couple of one-off outdoor distanced gigs. <laughs> oh, right. Nice. With people that were weird. And you felt, <laughs> you felt like in, in oh, my no. case, I always in the back of my head was, should we be doing this? I think we should be. Oh, yeah. Even outdoors distanced. Is it irresponsible of us to be bringing people together this way? So I kind of always had that going. But I, I did in yeah. 2021 in the fall, I went to Europe for five or six weeks and that was the first oh, yes. for real thing and i talked about this actually in my last episode how there seemed to be just a dark presence out there in the world 
when I was, I mean, it was wonderful to be on the road and it was wonderful to be playing and people were really appreciative to have music back. Like a lot of the places we went to play, we were the first show they'd had. Wow. Right? That's amazing. And so it, there was this great sense of relief and movement. I mean, when I got the first vaccination, I had tears in my eyes. Like, oh, same. Like, like this is happening. Maybe there's a light at the end of the tunnel. Yeah, I felt exactly the same. Um, Such relief. When we went on the road in September of 21, I was still very anxious, still struggling with a lot of what I had gone through. I'm still struggling with it in some ways. Mm. So there was that kind of veneer was on it. And the pandemic still existed. And we didn't, I mean, we didn't know if we were, one of us was going to get it. Yeah. And then it's time to fly home and we can't. And what are we going to do about it? And then I've not really talked about this on the program, but about a week into that tour, on top of everything else, my mom had a stroke and a heart attack and she died. <laughs> oh my God. Oh, I'm so sorry. Uh, and oh I was trapped God. in Europe. I mean, the, the timing of things and with getting, um, like having to have positive, negative tests and the process of doing that, I wasn't, it wasn't feasible for me to go home and no. be a part of that. So on top of all of this, there was this happening with my family and then there was this sort of guilt attached to that for me. I'm not trying to turn this into a sob story. I'm just saying no, my no. first time back out on the road was not great it, yeah well, in some ways it was the playing was great and being in the show and once we got comfortable it was great but there were just these layers of veneer on top of things that yeah. made it really strange yeah i can't i can't even imagine how that must have been it was just weird the whole thing was just weird and i don't know and and coming home from that was coming home to still a great deal of uncertainty just about the pandemic and I knew that uh, I was out again at that point with Sarah Smith, and I knew that that was probably the end of my run with Sarah. Um, she had moved away, and so it's like I've had a sense that this was the end of that for me. Right. Okay. Now what? Like, and yeah. again, it was dark, dark alley time. It was not wide right. open field time. Yeah, <laughs> dark alley time. Yeah. Interestingly. I felt that on that tour, I played the best that I ever had. Well, that's interesting. That's weird, that's right? That's interesting to me. Yeah. Do you think that was knowing that it was like in your head, you thought it was the last time, so you just gave everything of yourself to it? Do you think it might have been that or something else? There may have been, because of the pandemic and because of that circumstance, there may have been more of a layer of appreciation. Yeah. But I also think I was just more confident as a player like again it was a lot happened to me during the pandemic emily a lot yeah i'm gathering that a lot changed saying. for me all right i had an ego breakdown i had to come to a recognition of where i'm living from where i'm wow. approaching life from and it was not exactly a spiritual awakening but not exactly not a spiritual awakening so i've got you yeah I um understand. A lot changed for me in terms of my ego and how I work with it. Not that I was an arrogant person. It's just what I was doing it for. What I was looking for out of it came from a very insecure place and a very egoic place. And that's not a bad thing. It's just where I was at the time. And that just got obliterated by the oh. pandemic. And, and I had to rebuild myself in a way that was approaching life and motivated by different things and that wow. came through in my playing so you became more authentic in your playing i suppose more true to who you are and want to be versus who you found yourself to be maybe before the pandemic maybe, maybe. but i i don't know <laughs> on, a, on a practical level i think it took some of the pressure out of my playing that's interesting because i no longer felt so much the need to be recognized for my playing if that makes sense it makes so much sense. You, you know have no I mean? idea how much that resonates with me. Yeah. yeah. And so yeah. once you don't need to be acknowledged for your playing, your playing becomes that much more free. Absolutely. Right? It becomes, it's like almost there's a barrier in between you and your playing. There's this bit in between and being able yeah. to take that away yeah. and just make it a direct connection. Something happens, something changes. Yeah. And 
I mean, it sounds like it was a painful uh, experience for you going through that, but I'm really happy for you, like that you've come out the other side and now you're in that place. I'm like, mostly out the other I'm side. I'm sure it's ongoing, but you know, it is. It, everything is an evolution, but it's it's remarkable to me how much things have changed in in ways that maybe only I even know about. But, but that's all that matters. Yeah. That's all that matters. It's, it's, it is about your connection with yourself. And that's kind of part of the reason that I decided to start challenging myself in the things that I was vulnerable about, because it was more about me connecting more with myself, my instrument, and just honoring that. Because I'm sure mm. that you feel this way too. Like, my drums have always been there for me, no matter what. Everything else can be in complete flux and who knows what's happening but I've always been able to come back to my drums. And if I can project myself honestly through my drums, I think that's all I can hope for. And as you say, it's not about getting recognition or judgment from anyone else. I'm, I'm happy just existing with my drums and whatever that means at that moment, you know, but that's, that's so inspiring what you're telling me about the place that you're at now. And I'm so, I can't tell you how happy I am that you're kind of in that headspace now because like I say, I can only imagine how difficult that must have been at the time to come through, you know? It was. It was awful, actually. But yeah. I'm not the only one. And it's true. In the end it it makes you it makes you better. And the music was there for me too. I mean, I I mentioned on one of your Instagram posts, and incidentally, everybody should be following Emily on Instagram because <laughs> you post up these wonderful questions. These existential and musical questions and the answers that come through are really, really interesting. And I, I have to restrain myself from answering all of them. I don't want to oh, be please, I dude. don't want to be all no. over your Instagram. Dude, I'm do you know what? I'm always fascinated by like where people's brains go with the questions that I ask. Because as I say, I'm fascinated by people, but you always say really like profound things. And I'm like, <laughs> dude, like I mean, why do you think when you said do you want to come back on the podcast? I was like, absolutely. Because I love chatting to you because I feel like <laughs> we connect on in that way. There's a lot of commonality in the way that we think about things. Things. and you're obviously a very deep thinker and 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 very purposeful and i i just i really appreciate that you appreciate the stuff that i'm putting out there and oh, i really I love do. the way that you connect so please always always comment i'm always fascinated with All your right. take on stuff really i'm fascinated by your questions they're they're really compelling but one of them i don't remember the exact question but i answered that during the pandemic and i didn't so much talk about what was going on with me mentally but at in the deepest throes of my anxiety the last thing I wanted to do was practice the drums. The last thing I wanted to do was anything. You know, I just wanted to shake. That's it. And one of the ways in which I coped with that was to learn the latest record by an artist called Sarah Harmer, who is a Canadian national treasure. And my <laughs> dream gig, I've said this a zillion times, my dream is to play with Sarah Harmer. And she's just a magnificent singer-songwriter. And she had released an album during the pandemic, Lousy Timing. It was, her, it was her first album in over a decade. Like she had, oh she had been gone off doing other stuff and then she came back. And so I'm like, I don't want to practice drums, but I'm going to learn this record as a way of keeping in touch with the instrument yes. and distracting myself from myself. <laughs> yes, and, I get that. <laughs> and so it, it, and I did learn the record front to back and it was a savior. It's one of the things that kept me sane when I was going insane. You know what I mean? And yeah. the drums have the ability to do that. Like, and the music that you love has the ability to do that. There have been loads of times when I've been on the road, and you know as well as I do, that even when the road is good, it can be difficult at times. And there are days where it's, it's rough. And one yeah. of the things that has saved me is putting on my headphones and just yeah. listening to a Cinderella record or a King's yeah. X record or something from whenever. It's like yeah. music has this amazing ability to just put you in different places or pull you out of places and yeah, and take you back in time as well. Absolutely. You know? And so I get what you're saying about how the drums are always there for you. And you know, they have been for me as well. And music has always been there. And that's such a potent thing. Yeah. I couldn't agree more. And like you say, on tour, yeah, you can be having the best time, but you do sometimes need those grounding moments of oh, just yeah. to remember 
who you are, where you've come from, like what's important to you, because it's very easy to get swept up in the tour bubble and that world, whatever that looks like, you know, and that can look like a million things. But when you're able to put on a record and just go, oh, yeah, this is me. This is yeah. who I am at my core. And, and it settles you, you know, um, because it's, you know, it's an anxious thing being on tour. Like even if it is great and you love the people around you, the whole nature of, sort of traveling so much is stress. Is, it's a stress on your body and on your soul, <laughs> you know, and you're eating God knows what every day. And, you know, it's very hard to keep fit if that's a big part of your life or whatever else. Um, and you're constantly in contact with the family that you have on tour. You know, if you're on a bus, you never really have any time alone or anything like that. So you need to find ways to just center yourself again. And music definitely is the quickest way Absolutely. to do that for me as well. So yep. I, I concur 100%. <laughs> music lovers understand that about music. It's, it's, music lovers are, it's a different relationship with music than, than casual listeners, I guess. Like there's something very, it's a soul thing, <laughs> you know. A hundred percent. It it connects in a in a next level kind of way. Um, yeah, it makes us more snobby though, as we said. Absolutely, and I <laughs> I relish that. Now. You know, yeah. I'm, I'm reaching an age where I'm allowed to get away with being that way. So, well, it's true. But the great thing about that, when you do find something new and it does connect, that is like. That I hit you full on in the face because oh, I'm yeah. like, oh my God, what is this? This is amazing. I remember driving home from a gig one time and uh, it was some radio show and they played um, the Isley Brothers' Highways of My Life. Wow. And it was the first time I'd ever heard that song. And I remember just being on the way back from a particular gig. It was like two in the morning and I just started crying. I was like, this is just the most incredible <laughs> thing I've ever heard. Like, what is this? How have I never heard this? And to this day, I love that song so much. Oh, I love the Ice Brothers. Oh, oh I've had that experience too of revisiting stuff that I had forgotten about. I've and oh. I've talked about a lot of that on this show over the years. You know, it's been years yeah. now. I was gonna say kudos to you. Like almost is it 150 episodes? You've almost this. This will be uh, 148 or nine. I'm not sure which wow, yet. Wow, that's congratulations. That's. I'm in awe. Oh, That's thank very you. cool. Well, like, there there have been a couple of extended hiatuses throughout, and it continues. Oh yeah, I've been to having evolve. hiatuses too. So yeah. well, I mean, that gives us a chance to talk about a drummer's guide too. Coming back, yeah. do you have time? I mean, how's your time here? Uh, I yes, I've got a bit more time. I kind of have to be going in about fifteen minutes. All right, I got three things we need to talk about in that fifteen minutes. But but okay, great. bring us back to a drummer's guide too. Okay, yeah. So uh, A Drummer's Guide too. so for anyone that hasn't heard about it, which you probably haven't, um, it's uh, a podcast that is about all the things that it takes to be a professional musician aside from actually playing your instrument. And I cover a lot of to topics, um, some of which we've sort of covered now, sort of a lot of mental health stuff or whether it's practical tips about what, you know, like how to audition effectively and what you should expect and things like that and dealing with feeling down or dealing with being on the road and trying to maintain sort of health on the road, uh, stuff like that. And it's just sharing my experiences basically with people to help anyone else that is trying to make it in the music industry basically and just sharing my yeah my experiences and I so the last episode I did of A Drummer's Guide 2 was uh, at the end of 2020 and um i was trying to think back as to why i stopped i was going to ask you why yeah so i cuz i i decided to start it up again and i've recorded a few episodes the first one's coming out on the 1st of july and i hadn't properly thought about why i'd stopped i just knew that i'd stopped and i'd assumed that it was because uh, we ended up moving house, um, new studio here. It's uh, beautiful. And, it looks great. Uh, oh, dude, I love it in here. It's my <laughs> safe haven. Um, but yeah, so I, I thought, oh, maybe it's because we were moving house or, you know, I, I was thinking all these things. But I realized today in sort of preparation for coming to talk to you, I was like, I remember now what it was. It was because it was the pandemic, obviously. It was sort of like we were deep into it at that point. And I just remember thinking, this is not valuable to people right now because mm. there are other things that are so much more important. And it almost seems offensive to be talking about these topics when they are not relevant. What is relevant is that people, you know, just stay healthy and, and try and like maintain whatever they, they don't need to be, you know, hearing about my experience. I just, it sort of was a mixture of like, who are you to be talking about this, which was not great, but it was also like, 
this isn't what we should all be focusing on right now. Like, it just doesn't feel right. So I sort of pivoted into doing things like live streams and stuff like that so that I could be in contact with people and just we could all chat about stuff. And it was kind of a little more loose, if that makes sense, rather than trying to like just do a monologue on a subject, essentially. Um, yeah. But what I realized recently was that actually I really miss it. I really miss being able to connect with my audience, put out information, obviously, I've had a myriad of experiences in the last year and a half or whatever it's been, two years uh, since that last episode came out. And, you know, people had been asking me, like, is it coming back? Like, yeah. where, where is it? And I was like, do you know what? Yeah, I, I really want to come back and do this. And I started re recording new episodes. And as soon as I recorded the first one, I was like, yeah, I love this. I'd oh, forgotten great. how much I love this. It's just... As your listeners can probably tell, I do enjoy blathering on a little bit. So it's always fun and just I'm always reading new things and I'm always sort of trying out new things with myself, like experimenting with stuff like mental stuff or drumming stuff or whatever it is, social media or anything. And I just love sharing what I found out, especially obviously if it works. <laughs> I'm right, like, oh, sure. this worked for me. Like, try this. It might work for you too. I'm just someone that I just love to share. I'm, I'm very much that person. You know, I know a lot of people are very gatekeepy with their information. Right. But I'm not that. I like to give it out because I feel like then it cultivates this thing of just finding out more and developing it and, and letting it evolve. And then it could turn into something else that you wouldn't have thought of because you're so busy trying to guard this information that you don't look to other sources and develop it. So it's it's really good for me in that way as well. So um, yeah, anyway, 1st of July, it's coming back officially. Well, I'm excited <laughs> too, because I, I really enjoyed it too. And it, it's practical. I mean, it's very, very practical stuff. And it's just fun. Like I've said, to other people, I, I enjoy listening to intelligent, articulate people talk about things that are really resonant for them. And so, I mean, your energy is fabulous. It always is. And then just listening to what you have to say is really great. So I'm glad it's coming back. That's great. Yes. Yes. Thank you. Yeah, I'm excited too. <laughs> All right. So we have to, I, I know time is tight. Tell us about the Count Me In documentary. I know we could probably do a whole episode on this, oh, but yeah. <laughs> I've watched it maybe three times I've watched it. Oh my gosh, um, that's awesome. But I'm just a watcher. Tell us about how on earth that happened and and your experience of it. Yeah, I mean, I, I, it's almost caught me off guard. Of course that happened since we last spoke. So although weirdly, I think it may not have happened, like as in I think it had already happened before we last spoke. Oh, really? So yeah, so... The count me in thing. So for anyone listening, um, I don't know, you probably, you may have already spoken about this on uh, this podcast. It's basically a documentary uh, that focuses on a group of drummers and our common experiences of being a drummer, what that means, what inspires us, you know, these common threads between us all. And I happen to be in it, which I'll explain in a minute because that was very random. Uh, people like Taylor Hawkins, uh, Roger Taylor, uh, Nico McBrain. I mean, there's a... Th there's so many drummers in it. I won't start listing them off. Uh, Chad Smith. Anyway. Um, Cindy Blackman. So the way that it's Cindy Blackman, Santana. <laughs> yeah, like, oh, it's so, oh, so good. Such a great group of people. And honestly, I feel so lucky and a little perplexed as to how I ended up there, but I'm very happy about it. So anyway, I think it was in 2018, I got a random phone call from uh, a woman who I've known for years. Her name is Louise King, and she was the editor for a drum magazine over here called Rhythm. Okay. And I've known Louise for years, like probably since I was about 16, just in passing, just in being in the industry. And... Um, she called me and she said, "Oh, uh, so I'm, I'm like, I'm making this documentary with a friend of mine, this director, Mark Lowe. Um, it's going to be about drummers. We don't really know what the final thing is going to look like, but would you be up for coming and doing an interview? And hopefully, we can feature you in it." And I was like, "Yeah, sure, that sounds like fun." You know, I get asked to do a lot of stuff, and I was just like, "Yeah, sure, it's just another thing, like another day." Um, anyway, I went to this uh, this kind of high rise flat type thing, um, and we filmed this interview. And it was great. I had a great time. They were asking me questions like, you know, the only other drummers would ask drummers, if you know <laughs> what I mean. Like, do you know what I mean? There was a connection there. I was like, oh, you know, you know, you know what you're doing here. Um, and I didn't think anything more of it. I was just like, cool, that was a fun thing to do. And I got on with my life. And then lo and behold, three and a half years later or whatever, I get another phone call, this time from the director, who basically said, oh, by the way, 
that documentary that you did, it got picked up by Netflix and it's coming out tomorrow. Wow. <laughs> I was like, uh, I'm sorry, what now? What are you talking about? <laughs> And yeah, and that was it. And then, and then uh, the next day it came out, I sat down to watch it. And I was like, you know, when you're just like, I have no idea what this is going to be. I don't yeah. know what it's about, really. I, I did know who else was in it. And I was like, wow, that's amazing. And I sat down and I don't know whether I mentioned uh, the last time we spoke, but my dad is in sort of like film and TV. So I've grown up very much uh, appreciating production values and the way things are shot and stuff like that. But <laughs> what comes with that is... Um, should we say a slight critical eye for uh. a lot of stuff? So I was a little bit scared. I was like, oh God, is it going to be awful? Anyway, I sat down to watch it and the opening scene oh. where they come over the observatory yeah. uh, in LA, I was like, oh my God, this is going to be brilliant. It's like, beautiful. Instantly, I was like, this is beautiful. I just love the way this is, this is shot. And then it went into the actual stories and even thinking about it now just gives me goosebumps because... Let's forget about the fact that I was in it. That is completely irrelevant to me. That documentary encapsulates the experience of being a drummer and the things that universally unite us in slightly varying ways, but our experience and our love for our instrument and the passion and just the camaraderie and the links between all drummers that I am convinced exist between all drummers. They captured that so beautifully that i just finished watching it and i was like i i just think that was brilliant i i don't know how i ended up there but i just thought it was so excellently done and i i'm so i feel so proud and so privileged to have got to be a part of it but honestly it just came from a random phone call and it it was just a random interview and it turned into that so um yeah again i feel so privileged to have been a part of it but i'm glad you enjoyed it as well uh, <laughs> It, it, you know, it just came from a random phone call. But the reality is, if you're not you, if you're not out there in the way you are, and if you have not accomplished what you have, you're not in that documentary because nobody knows who you are, right? So it's like go, all the way back to that Foo Fighters cover that got you into the darkness, et cetera. It's like... Exactly. It be, always comes from a random phone call. It was the same with The Voice Kids, the musical director. I hadn't spoken to him for about seven years, and he just randomly called me. He's like, do you want to go for a coffee? And I was like, uh, yeah. <laughs> Okay, that's weird. And then he's like, "Do you want the gig?" And I was like, "Uh, yeah, yeah, I do." <laughs> so it all, yeah, so it always comes from a random place that you never expect. And again, it's part of the thing that I love about the chaos of life. Everything can change in one phone call, and it might not change in that moment. But retrospectively, it's like, oh my gosh, if that hadn't happened, yeah, I wouldn't be here right now. So, right. Um, yeah, it's it's pretty incredible, really. But I I hope you are using all of that just as reminders that you belong <laughs> <laughs> oh, you're, you're lovely john <laughs> none of this comes to you if you're not worthy of it and deserving of it so oh, remember that, that. Uh, do not forget like, that part i'm grabbing hold of my leg right now because i feel so awkward with you saying that and me accepting that but i thank no, you no this is That's... your this is your curriculum is to learn to <laughs> accept true. a compliment from people all right <laughs> It's true. Thank you, John. You are very kind. How's that? Uh, excellent. Excellent. All right. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> we, we have to talk about one more thing before, I, before you go. So what's going to happen is we're going to talk about this thing. It'll be very quick. Okay. And then we'll say goodbye. But please stay on the line for a couple of minutes and we'll do some okay. afters. Okay. You have to tell me about performing in front of and meeting Arsene Wenger. We are both okay. Arsenal fans, everybody, we and are. Arsene Wenger is a, the greatest manager in the history of, I'm going to say the Premier League, but certainly yeah. of Arsenal. He's a I legend, would... and Emily has a great story about him. Oh, you say a great story. It, it is. It's slightly embarrassing for me. So I was in Geneva. I was playing at the IWC convention, or I don't even know what it was. So it's a watch company, basically, expensive watch company. They were putting on a corporate uh, show, and I was playing it with Brian Ferry. And um, we were getting ready to go on stage, and I'm not even sure how the manager found out. Maybe I told him uh, that I was a big Arsenal fan, and this 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 corporate gig was just full of celebrities. It was kind of just 
jam packed and I'm useless. I don't recognize anyone. I don't know who anyone is. It's just who I am. I, you know, anyone can walk up to me and I'll talk to you like it, you're anyone else because that's just how I am. Anyway, the tour manager said to me, Oh, by the way, there's someone here uh, t- tonight that I think that you'll appreciate. I was like, Oh, right. Who's that? It's like Arsene Wenger. I was like, No way. That's amazing. Oh my gosh. So then in my head, I was like, Right, I'm going to really perform. It's going to be awesome. So we go and play this gig and it went really well. It was fine. I was sort of trying to scout him out. Couldn't see him. I saw a couple of people who I cannot remember off the top of my head right now because my memory's so bad, uh, but didn't see him. And I was like, well, at least Arsene Wenger has seen me play in some capacity. That's kind of cool. Uh, and then went backstage, was sort of like getting a drink and sort of uh, getting undressed or whatever. And then <laughs> the manager comes up and she said, got someone uh, that you might want to meet. And I was like... <laughs> Who's that then? And then he points over and there is Arsene Wenger. And I am like this puppy dog uh-huh. just running up to him. <laughs> like, <laughs> and I was like, hi, hi. It's so nice to meet you. He's very tall. I was like, it's really nice to meet you. Like, hi, I'm Emily. And I just wanted to say that I, I, I love you. I'm <laughs> such an idiot. And I was like, I loved your 96, 9017. That was when I was like really into football. And I really enjoy it. And I really love, I love you so much. And he, bless him. He was so sweet. He was like, oh, well, thank you very much. And he's so suave. Oh, he's I forgot that he's French. Oh, he's oh, a yeah. pro. He's like, oh, thank you very much. I, I enjoyed the show. And I was like, oh, thank you so much. And then I just went blank. Like, literally, <laughs> now what do I say? Nothing. And then he was like, oh, so uh, are you all flying back tomorrow? And I was like, yeah. Again, nothing. <laughs> and then I was just like, Okay, well, I'm going to go get a drink. It was nice to meet you. Bye. And I just walked away like, oh, I'm an idiot. I'm such an idiot. But he was so, he was so sweet. And I was just like, yeah, that, that's cool. But I properly fangirled into him. It was crazy. But then I told you the Ewan McGregor part of that story, didn't I? No, I didn't hear that part of the story. Oh, my God. So I've just basically told Arsene Wenger I love him, then walked away. And then I'm standing with the, some of the other girls in the band and I'm just going, I'm an idiot. They don't know who he is, so <laughs> it's fine. I was just like, I've just made a complete fool of myself. But you know what? I don't care. And anyway, then I look over, the door opens and there standing is Ewan McGregor. And I was like, oh, I recognize him. Awesome. That's Ewan McGregor. And he sees me and makes a beeline for me. And uh-huh. I was like, what is happening? Like, I don't. I don't understand. Why are you coming over to look at me? Anyway, and he start he starts going, I love your playing. That was so amazing. I enjoyed the gig so much. Da, 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 da. And I was like, uh, uh, thank you. Okay. <laughs> um, and then because uh, I'm like, I don't know what I don't know what to say to you. And then he just went, Oh, I'm really sorry. Um, so I play the drums as well. And I was like, Oh, no way. And, uh, and he was like, Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then we spent about like 15 minutes just talking about drums and the fact his daughter wanted to play drums, and he was just the sweetest dude and just so easy to chat to. And after my moment with Arsene Wenger, I was like, oh, this is kind of evened it out for me. And uh, yeah, so that was a really, really, really nice uh, experience with Ewan McGregor. So who knew Ewan McGregor he used to play drums? He, he got a drum kit when he was, I want to say nine. Mm-hmm. And I think it was a sonar drum kit for wow. Christmas. That's what I've got in my head. I remember random facts about people and I'm pretty sure that's one about him. So uh, yeah. Did I tell you about meeting Tony Adams as well? No. Oh, Arsenal legend. Another Arsenal legend. So he was like the captain of the team when I was watching them um, a lot, like when I was obsessed with them. And uh, I was just, it was this drum camp thing that was happening in North London. It was a local thing. And uh, there was a jam night one of the nights. So we were all just, uh, it was just like a bunch of drummers and a house band, essentially. And people were getting up and I got up to play and whatever. And I came off stage and my drum teacher, a guy called Mike Dolbear, he was the one that was running this camp. And um, he said, oh, by the way, over there, uh, that's uh, Tony Adams. And I was like, what are you talking about? Like, <laughs> what are you talking about? He said, yeah. So he's now coaching this Turkish football team and they're all here. And they just asked if they could come and watch. So, yeah, that's him over there. And I was like. Oh my gosh. So I went over to him. I This was after the Arsene Wenger incident, so I knew not to be too like, okay. la, la, la. so I was like, oh, hi. I just wanted to say hi and, you know, I love your playing. And, and he went, oh, thank you so much. I really enjoyed your playing as well. And I was like, thank you so much. Oh my God, Tony Adams has seen me play drums. This is the best day ever. 
So the only person that I definitely want to meet now, well, there's a few, but top of the list, Ian Wright. That's my next one that he, we're going to be best friends, whether he wants it or not. Me and Ian Wright are going to be best friends. <laughs> he's, a, he's around. He is. Some players, you just can't access. You just can't get to them. But Ian Wright, I think, is around. Like, I think you can find yeah. him. So that's. I, I, I guarantee I'm going to run into him. I know I am. I just know it. And I don't know how I know it, but it's going to happen. And then next time we talk, I'm going to be telling you about when I became best friends with Ian Wright. Oh, that's exciting. <laughs> it's like, like I say to people all the time, music drops you into such interesting places and, and in yes. front of such interesting random people, you know? It's so cool. Yeah, who, who you connect with in a weird way as well. Like I say, the Ewan McGregor thing. When would you ever think that that would happen? That is so random. That's crazy. And bless him for coming and saying hello, because there's no way I would have gone and said hello to him. Like, you know, I just, like, as far as I knew, we didn't have anything in common, so I wouldn't have struck up a conversation necessarily. Um, and I don't want to be, like, weird or anything. But he was <laughs> We wouldn't want that, sweet. no. Wouldn't want that. I mean, I'm weird <laughs> enough. Crikey, I'm Riley. <laughs> so, <laughs> but yeah, life is weird, and I love it. I absolutely love it. Well, you are absolutely, I, like, I find you an enormous inspiration. Oh, I really John. do. Well, and, I feel um, the same about you. <laughs> thank you. And uh, I just, just watching what you're doing online and how things are, are just working for you is really instructive and really inspirational. So keep thank going, you. Emily. Same for you, John. You keep going too. I'm loving it. I shall do my it. best. I will do my best. All right. I'm going to let do. you at last go, but please do hang on the line. Yep. And uh, thank you so much for spending this time with us. Thank you so much for having me. Once again, an absolute pleasure. And let's do it again in four years' time and see where we're both at. I can't well, let's wait not. To let's see. not wait four years. All right, maybe a little less. Yeah. I'm getting older, <laughs> Emily. I can't work in four-year chunks anymore. So, <laughs> you know, fair enough. Right? I'm, I'm down. I'm down. <laughs> All right. Uh, say goodbye, Emily. Goodbye, Emily. All right. Thanks, everyone. We will talk to you soon. Should we start our own podcast where we just once a week chat for half an hour and put it yeah. in there? Dude, I don't think we could physically cut it down to half an no, hour. No, I don't think it's so either. too much to talk about. <laughs> <laughs> we'd, just, we'd be going on for hours. It would be awesome. <laughs>